This cool thing happens when you take the Laplacian and you define it in terms of the boundary times the co-boundary. And what happens is that the orientations just go away. Right? You had to orient your boundary matrix. Right? So you gave an orientation to every edge. So every column of that boundary matrix was like a plus one and a minus one. Um, it, and at first you say, well, maybe I should think hard about how to choose it. And then it seems like once you take the Laplacian, the orientation just vanishes. It all just cancels out. It seems great. Um, on the other hand, there are some cases where we really maybe should think a little bit more about how we choose our orientations. And um, in particular, if we have a graph that's planar and three connected, and we look at its oriented boundary matrix, we we also have this boundary matrix for its dual graph. And it turns out that there's maybe a right way to assign uh, an orientation to the dual graph so that the, um, the isomorphism between cycles and cuts that we saw for planar graphs just becomes actually in some ways just inequality. And in fact, these operators, these boundary operators, um, will just cancel each other out in a beautiful way. All right, so I'm gonna work through that here. Here's the uh, kind of our starting picture. Remember, here's a graph, and I had two different boundary matrices. Uh, in this case, uh, I've oriented the edges one way, and in this one, I think I flipped the first edge, and I flipped the last edge, and I kept this one the same. So it's two different orientations on the same graph, and we can ask, like, which one is better? Okay. And in the bigger picture, remember we've got, um, I drew these, these letters all square, but I really should have used my curly V and my curly E, right? This is the, the space, the vertex space of the graph and the edge space of the graph. And then also there's this face space of the graph, which you could think of as the vertex space of the dual graph G star, right? And we have this important theorem, right? About the cycle space of the graph, which was just the image of the co-boundary. And uh, I'm sorry, this is not right. Let's get this right. Is this right? This doesn't look right to me. I think it's supposed to be uh, this is supposed to be the cut space, right? Is the uh, image of the co-boundary, and that is isomorphic to the kernel of this one, which is the oh, get rid of my stars here. I got my stars all mixed up. <laughs> this is going to be isomorphic to this, which is what this is the cycle space of the dual. And I guess this works both ways, um, so ignore this big mess right here. Let me do it right. There we go. Yes, ah, oh, much better. I know everyone feels better now. So we have uh, the cut space of one graph is isomorphic to the cycle space of its dual, and vice versa. Um, so, so this comes about now if I look at these linear maps. If I were to kind of compose some of these, like if I were to kind of go from V um, to E via the co-boundary map and then uh, to F by the boundary map of the dual graph, um, you can ask like what happens when I put these together? And actually th that's gonna be the main subject of what we look at here. So what we'd like to happen is that uh, the boundary of the dual applied to the co-boundary should just come out at zero, which should just be zero. And really, we want it, this, this isomorphism to just become equality, but it really won't be unless we're careful about two things. Right? One is the order of the edges, and two is the orientation of those edges. Now, if I'm thinking about these two sets, or if I think of these as subspaces, and I know that they seem to both be subspaces of the space of edges here, but in order to get that, I kind of need to identify the edges of the graph with the dual edges. And, and that's not too hard to do, um, but it's not maybe the most obvious. So to, to work this out, I drew an example. So this is a very, simple three planar three connected graph. It's just the tetrahedron, it's K4. And I, draw its, I drew its dual here in red on top. 
And I didn't want to wrap these guys around, so these all go out to vertex 3 of the dual. Okay, now you might think that because the graph and its dual are isomorphic, you might just give them the same boundary uh, matrix. And that would actually be the wrong thing to do. So once I labeled the vertices, I can write out this uh, boundary matrix, say, for the original graph. I put it over here in the transpose, and I just orient it. Oh, I actually didn't orient the edges at all. First, I just want to see what the edges are. And so this, these are all going to be changed. Some There's going to be some minuses put in here. Or if you like, you could think of this as our original incidence matrix over GF2. And uh, I'm not using the signs yet. Um, I just want to get the order right first. And you'll see that the edge from 0 to 1 here, which is this edge here, is dual to the edge from 1 to 2. So it's actually a different edge over here. And there's the edge, just to be clear. My vertices in the dual, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So that edge zero, from 1 to 2 is the one that's dual to the edge from 0 to 1 in the other graph. And so the numbering is going to change. There's no, it's not an accident. In fact, there's no way I could have rearranged these numbers to get the same boundary matrix. And in fact, maybe you also already realize that there shouldn't be a way to get the same boundary matrix because if they were the same, this would just be the Laplacian. It would certainly not be zero. All right, so once I know to just be careful about ma matching up the indices, that is the ordering, of each edge with its dual edge. That gives me the right ordering, and now I have to figure out the sign. Now, if I were to work th through this and do the matrix multiplication out, I think you would see that every time I get to a term, there's, exact, there's either two or zero multiplications. So in base two here, it is, in fact, uh, zero. Um, is that right? It's a little wild, right? So in base two, this thing is going to come out to be zero. Every row is going to either be, have zero or two terms. Okay. And what are those terms? Well, think of it this way. Each term is going from, I have a face to an edge and that edge to a vertex. And so I have a face for every face and every vertex. There are, in fact, two ways to get from a face to an edge to a vertex. And these are the, there's always two ways if, if that face, if that vertex is on that face. I get these two possibilities, so I'm going to add one or the other. So after we've ordered the edges, we can think about the signs and the, that is the signs of, or the orientations of the edges. And what I claim is that we can orient one of the graphs however we want. So if we orient, we start with one graph oriented, let's say G was oriented. So let's just say we took a, kind of a pretty ordinary orientation where it was like plus one, minus one, going left to right. Then I can, I'm going to find a corresponding orientation for the dual that makes everything cancel out. And so we're going to zoom in on these little diamonds here that you get from a face and a vertex. And we're going to see how to set up those orientations in a way. And it's going to turn out that the geometry is useful. Okay. And here's the rule. So looking at this face, I can ask the following question. I've drawn here an orientation of uh, the original graph. The edges around this face are all oriented one way or another in green. Now, as I go out from this face, I get to the edge, I either turn left or I turn right. Okay, you see that the relationship from every edge to its dual edge is either a right turn or a left turn. And what I'm going to do is just assign plus one to left turns and minus one to right turns. So remember, if I'm thinking about orienting these dual edges, that means for each face, that's on that edge, right? There's another face over here. This edge goes all the way out to another face. But this edge, for this edge and this face, I'm going to have a plus one here or a minus one. 
So I have to decide what that is, and, and this is how I'm going to do it. From this perspective, I'm going to say, okay, left turns are plus one, and right turns are minus one. Hopefully I get this right, uh, plus one and minus one. Okay. All right, so now what happens is when I uh, look at the, the product of the boundary of the dual and the co-boundary of the original graph, every entry is going to be the sum of these two things. And so uh, let me also add in some arrows because this plus one now, I should think of it as, um, we'll think of that as being oriented out. This is the orientation on these edges and the minus ones will be oriented in. Okay. And so when I, when I have the face F here, let's call this F and the vertex V and I look at the terms I get, I get uh, plus one times, this is coming in times a minus one. So that's minus one. Right from the perspective of V, that looks like a minus one. And this one also looks like a minus one. And I'm gonna get, so plus one times minus one, plus minus one times minus one. And so in this case, that will be zero. And what I wanted was it for it to be zero everywhere. Okay, and so having this consistent left turns, you can check that there's only a couple cases, right? If, they, if it's a left turn and a right turn, they're gonna cancel out. Um, if it's a left turn and another left turn, right, that will change the sign of this one, but it also change the sign of this one, right? So since both signs change, uh, the thing, the whole sum stays zero. Okay, so this is how you would do orientations geometrically. And we're gonna put this to use, um, thinking a little bit more about um, not just embedding graphs, not just getting nice convex embeddings, but also maybe getting embeddings where um, I can really uh, arrange my edges and their dual edges so that they make nice right turns, right? And that's um, gonna be really useful for us. But the key, like the most important thing you should take away from this is that when you have a planar graph, you can orient its dual so that this equation is satisfied. Let's see, oh, the dual, transpose equals zero, okay? Now, you may also, if you've ever studied homology theory or heard of it, you may recognize that this idea of kind of some kind of composition of these coming out to zero, this really is the foundation of homology theory. Um, so usually it doesn't show up this way because usually you don't have a graph here, but, um, but this, is really, this is really the starting point.